Hello video viewers, welcome back to the third part of this three-part series that I'm doing in which I'm reading extracts from the classic science fiction story War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. And uh, let me just check that uh, the audio is working. The audio appears to be working. So let's begin. I've got to put my headphones on, whoops, so I can monitor the sound that I'm recording. Okay, so here we go. So this is part three of The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. I'm not reading the entire story, just extracts of it. And yes, this is the third and final part. So please make sure that you have watched or listened to parts one and two before uh, you check this one out, okay? Uh, links for the other two. If you're watching this on YouTube, you'll find links to the other two parts of this story in the description. So obviously you've got to check out parts one and two before uh, this one, all right? So... Let's carry on, and I'm just going to give you a recap of the story so far, okay, just to keep you, just to bring you up to speed. So, basically, without realising it, the, the people of Earth have been attacked by an aggressive alien species from Mars, with the intention of colonising our planet while escaping their home planet, which has become uninhabitable. The Martians are vastly superior to us in terms of their intelligence and technology. They're also unfriendly, very unfriendly. Humans are now reduced to the status of mere animals or insects in the presence of these things. Human society has quickly turned to chaos and destruction as the Martians begin their campaign to take our planet. The aliens first landed in, um, in a cylinder... Uh, which fell from space with a green flash. After the cylinder opened, revealing the visitors to be awkward and clumsy in our atmosphere, their technology proved to be devastatingly powerful. They are armed with a heat ray, which they've used to clear out all life surrounding the fallen chamber. The narrator of the story witnessed the Martians emerging from their cylinder and the ruthless destructive power of their heat ray, but still doesn't yet realise the full scale of the invasion. He decides to escape the area and travel in the direction of London. During the night, he sees another cylinder landing and then sees the first Martian tripods striding over the countryside. These are the vehicles the Martians use and they are colossal and formidable. Suddenly, the clumsy Martians are mobile and far more physically powerful than in their normal naked form. And also, I should add that the uh, narrator has a wife who he's left in a town called Leatherhead. He went back to return a horse that he'd borrowed, and that's when he saw the uh, his first glimpse of um, of the tripods. And uh, the horse and cart crashed. The horse died, so he's now kind of stranded. And is he going to be able to get back to his wife? This is the thing. Okay, so in a moment, I'm going to read uh, an extract from chapter twelve of the book. But before that, I need to just give you a summary of chapter 11, which is the next part of the story. So the, the narrator manages to find his way back to his home, which is still standing. And from the upstairs window of his study, the narrator observes the destruction of his village and the fires all around the common, as well as the outlines of three creatures moving in the pit, which he can see from a distance. He hardly recognises his surroundings. The narrator begins to comprehend that the creatures from the cylinder operate the tripods, comparing them to a human-driven steam engine, which is obviously an example of the highest, one of the highest forms of technology that they had at the time on Earth. He invites a soldier who is outside the house to hide inside, and the, the soldier uh, recounts the futile military efforts against the Martians who easily destroyed both companies of soldiers and their weaponry before emerging as tripods from the pit and destroying the railway station and a train. The artilleryman, the soldier, managed to escape. The two men, the narrator and the soldier, look again from the window to see three tripods at the pit as the sun comes up, the narrator sees destruction so indiscriminate and so universal as to be unprecedented in human warfare. H.G. Wells describes the horrific feeling of realising that these Martians are far more powerful than humans. Each cylinder contains at least three tripods, and each tripod is armed with a heat ray. 
Later, we learn more about the Martians and their technology as the narrator manages to observe them more, but they are still completely mysterious for the most part. Meanwhile, people have become like refugees from a war zone, and there is general chaos as people attempt to escape, get resources, and look after themselves. Shepparton Station has become a target for the Martians in their tripods, and they've been destroying it, the railway lines and the trains. This is especially poignant because they are targeting our infrastructure, and our technology seems infinitely primitive to that of the Martians, and we are often compared to animals, insects or bugs, or even microorganisms in comparison to our alien visitors. H.G. Wells makes a point of observing how society reacts to a moment like this and how fragile it is, while also contrasting the familiar, cosy surroundings of the English home counties with the bizarre, grotesque and strange images of these very bad aliens from Mars. The narrator and the soldier he met choose to leave the house. The soldier wants to go to London and the narrator wants to get back to his wife in Leatherhead. They end up in Weybridge, uh, which is a town just on the River Thames, with London to the east and the Thames Valley to the west. This is a place where the Thames River meets the Way, another river. It's a sort of port where you can get a ferry across to the other side. Crowds of people are gathered there, hoping to get on the ferry. The army have placed rows of large artillery guns behind some trees as they expect the tripods to come from a nearby town that is currently under attack. This, is all, this all happens close to the edge of the water and is full of really precise and specific vocabulary to describe the action that takes place. So they're there next to the river in this important spot. Nearby town has just been sort of destroyed by the Martians in their tripods. Everyone is The, the, the army have set up rows of guns and there's a weird atmosphere where a lot of people still probably haven't seen uh, the Martians and they're not fully aware of the threat, but there is panic in the air. So let's move on to chapter 12, what I saw of the destruction of Weybridge and Shepparton. This is just an extract from the chapter. We remained at Weybridge until midday, and at that hour we found ourselves at the place near Shepparton Lock, where the Way and Thames join. Part of the time we spent helping two old women to pack a little cart. The way has a treble mouth, meaning it sort of three goes off in three directions. And at this point, boats are to be hired, and there was a ferry across the river. On the Shepparton side was an inn with a lawn, and beyond that, the tower of Shepparton Church rose above the trees. Here we found an excited and noisy crowd of fugitives, as yet the flight had not grown to panic, but there were already far more people than all the boats going to and fro could enable to cross. People came panting along under heavy burdens. One husband and wife were even carrying a small outhouse door between them, with some of their household goods piled thereon. One man told us he meant to try to get away from Shepparton Station. So, noisy crowd of fugitives, the flight had not grown to panic. Flight meaning escape. This had not grown, turned into a panic yet, but there were already many more people than could actually get on the boats. People carrying lots of their possessions. There was a lot of shouting and one man was even jesting, meaning sort of like joking around. The idea people seemed to have here was that the Martians were simply formidable human beings who might attack and sack the town or, you know, destroy the town, to be certainly destroyed in the end. Every now and then, people would glance nervously across the way at the meadows towards Chertsey, but everything over there was still. Across the Thames, except just where the boats landed, everything was quiet, in vivid contrast with the Surrey side. The people who landed there from the boats went tramping off down the lane. The big ferry boat had just made a journey. Three or four soldiers stood on the lawn of the inn, staring and jesting at the fugitives without offering to help. The inn was closed as it was now within prohibited hours. What's that? cried a boatman. And shut up, you fool, said a man near me to a yelping dog. Then the sound came again. 
this time from the direction of Chertsey, a muffled thud, the sound of a gun. <laughs> the fighting was beginning. Almost immediately, unseen batteries across the river to our right, unseen because of the trees, took up the chorus, firing heavily one after the other. So a battery is like a row of guns, and they started firing. A woman screamed. Everyone stood arrested by the sudden stir of battle. Near us, and yet invisible to us, nothing was to be seen save flat meadows, cows feeding unconcernedly for the most part, and silvery pollard willows motionless in the warm sunlight. So he's describing the scene that's still fairly calm, um, you know, fields, cows feeding without realising that anything's going on, the trees um, sitting motionless in the warm sunlight. The soldiers will stop them, said a woman beside me, doubtfully. A haziness rose over the treetops. Haze is like maybe a mist or a slight smoke, which means that the air is not completely clear. Then suddenly we saw a rush of smoke far away up the river. A puff of smoke that jerked up into the air and hung. And forthwith the ground, the ground heaved underfoot and a heavy explosion shook the air. <laughs> smashing two or three windows in the houses near and leaving us astonished. Here they are, shouted a man in a blue jersey. Yonder, do you see them? Yonder. Yonder means over there. Quickly, one after the other, one, two, three, four of the armoured Martians appeared, far away over the little trees, across the flat meadows that stretched towards Chertsey, and striding hurriedly towards the river. Little cowled figures they seemed at first, going with a rolling motion and as fast as flying birds. Little cow cowled figures in the distance, cowled meaning wearing what looked like sort of hoods or or um, fabric over them. Looked like little figures with, with hoods on, maybe, in the distance. Then, advancing obliquely towards us, came a fifth. Obliquely means off at a different angle. Their armoured bodies glittering in the sun as they swept swiftly forward upon the guns, growing rapidly larger as they grew nearer. One on the extreme left, the remotest, that is, flourished a huge case high in the air, and the ghostly, terrible heat ray I had already seen on Friday night smote towards Chertsey and struck the town. Smote is the past of smite, smite meaning to strike or hit or smash. So one of them's carrying the heat ray, raised it up and, and fired it upon Chertsey, the town. At the sight of these strange, swift and terrible creatures, the crowd near the water's edge seemed to me to be for a moment horror-struck. There was no screaming or shouting, but a silence. Then a hoarse murmur and a movement of feet, a splashing from the water. A hoarse murmur. A murmur is like the sound, you know, it's like a low-level sound of maybe people's voices. Hoarse is like a rough voice that you might get if you have a sore throat or something like that. Maybe the sound of people starting to scream. A man, too frightened to drop the portmanteau he carried on his shoulder, that's a kind of a bag, he swung round and sent me staggering with a blow from the corner of his burden. Burden is something you're carrying. So a man with a large bag turned round and hit the narrator, sending him staggering. A woman thrust at me with her hand and rushed past me. I turned with the rush of the people, but I was not too terrified for thought. The terrible heat ray was in my mind. To get underwater, that was it. Get underwater, I shouted, unheeded, meaning nobody heard him. I faced about again, turned around again, and rushed towards the approaching Martian, rushed right down the gravelly beach and headlong into the water. Others did the same. A boatload of people putting back, came leaping out as I rushed past. The stones under my feet were muddy and slippery, and the river was so low that I ran perhaps twenty feet scarcely waist deep. Then, as the Martian towered overhead, scarcely a couple of hundred yards away, I flung myself forward under the surface. 
The splashes of the people in the boats leaping into the river sounded like thunderclaps in my ears. People were landing hastily on both sides of the river, but the Martian machine took no more notice for the moment of the people running this way and that than a man would of the confusion of ants in a nest against which his foot has kicked. As an example of some sort of fairly old-fashioned formal sentence structure. The Martian machine took no notice of the people running this way and that than a man would of the confusion of ants in a nest against which his foot has kicked. So the Martian doesn't take any more notice than a man would if, you know, uh, uh, the man, a man wouldn't really notice ants rushing away from a nest that he's kicked with his foot. When, half suffocated, I raised my head above water, the Martian's hood pointed at the batteries of guns that were still firing across the river, and as it advanced, it swung loose what must have been the generator of the heat ray. In another moment, it was on the bank, and in a stride wading halfway across, the knees of its foremost legs bent at the, further, at the farther bank, and in another moment, it had raised itself up to its full height again, close to the village of Shepperton. Forthwith, meaning right then, the six guns, which, unknown to anyone on the right bank, had been hidden behind the outskirts of that village, fired simultaneously. The sudden near concussion, the last close upon the first, made my heart jump. The monster was already raising the case, generating the heat ray, as the first shell burst six yards above the hood. A shell is like a sort of a, um, a bomb, an explosive device that's fired from a gun. So the first shell burst six yards above the hood of the, the Martian, not quite hitting it. I gave a cry of astonishment, and that's like a surprise and shock. I saw and thought nothing of the other four Martian monsters. My attention was riveted upon the nearer incident. Simultaneously, two other shells burst in the air near the body as the hood twisted round. So two more shells burst nearby as the hood twisted round in time to receive, but not in time to dodge, the fourth shell. So the hood twisted round and it received the fourth shell. I mean, the fourth shell hit it. It didn't have time to dodge to avoid it. The shell burst clean in the face of the thing. The hood bulged, flashed, and was whirled off in a dozen tattered fragments of red flesh and glittering metal. So as the shell exploded and hit the thing right in the face, the hood of it bulged, like expanded, flashed, and then was whirled off. It spun off in a dozen, meaning many, tattered fragments of red flesh tattered fragments tattered if you get some clothing and you rip it to pieces those those will be tattered fragments of clothing in this case it's tattered fragments of red flesh this is the fresh this is the fresh well the fresh flesh i suppose this is the flesh of the martian inside the tripod exploding and it it whirled off in tattered fragments of red flesh and glittering metal hit shouted i with something between a scream and a cheer i heard answering shouts from the people in the water about me i could have leaped out of the water with that momentary exultation that cry of you know uh, delight or um, celebration the decapitated colossus reeled like a drunken giant reeled meaning it sort of lost control and moved in an uncontrolled way but it did not fall over it recovered its balance by a miracle and no longer heeding its steps and with the camera that fired the heat ray now rigidly upheld it reeled swiftly upon shepperton so it managed to recover its balance even though the pilot is dead and it's no longer heeding its steps no longer aware of where it's stepping and with the the camera for the heat ray is is just held rigidly above it reeled it moved in a sort of uncontrolled way towards shepperton the living intelligence the martian with the within the hood was slain meaning killed 
and splashed to the four winds of heaven. There's a nice phrase, meaning it had been sent sent this way and that, just poof, destroyed, blown up. And the thing was now but a mere intricate device of metal whirling to destruction. It drove along in a straight line, incapable of guidance. It struck the tower of Shepperton Church, smashing it down as the impact of a battering ram might have done. A battering ram is a large, long thing that you'd use to smash a door down. So the thing smashed into the church tower like a battering ram and and the church, like a, like a battering ram might have done, swerved aside, blundered on, sort of continued going in a clumsy, chaotic way, uncontrolled way, and collapsed with tremendous force into the river out of my sight. A violent explosion shook the air and a spout of water, steam and mud and shattered metal shot far up into the sky. As the camera of the heat ray hit the water, the latter, that's the water, had immediately flashed into steam. In another moment, a huge muddy tidal wave, almost scoldingly hot, came sweeping around the bend upstream. Suddenly a huge wave of scoldingly hot water. Scolding means burning. You get burnt by fire, you get scalded by hot water, hot liquid. So a scoldingly hot tidal wave came sweeping around the bend of the river. I saw people struggling shorewards, struggling to get to the shore, to the edge, and heard their screaming and shouting faintly above the seething and roar of the Martians' collapse. For a moment I heeded nothing of the heat, forgot the patent need of self-preservation, I splashed through the tumultuous water, the sort of, you know, the rough water, pushing aside a man in black to do so until I could see round the bend. Half a dozen deserted boats pitched aimlessly upon the confusion of the waves. So the boats are going up and down. The fallen Martian came into sight downstream, lying across the river and for the most part submerged. So mostly under the water. Thick clouds of steam were pouring off the wreckage, and through the tumultuously whirling wisps I could see, intermittently and vaguely, the gigantic limbs churning the water and flinging a splash and spray of mud and froth into the air. So the huge limbs, the legs, are kind of moving the water like this and flinging lots of splashes of water and spray of mud and froth. This is like when water is churned up and it turns into like bubbles. Froth is like what you get on the top of beer. All this water and mud and froth flying into the air. The tentacles swayed and struck like living arms. And save for the helpless purpose, purposelessness. And save for the helpless purpose. <laughs> and save for the helpless purposelessness of these movements, it was as if some wounded thing was struggling for its life amid the waves. Save so, except for the movements, it was like some wounded thing, some wounded animal was struggling for its life in the middle of the waves. Enormous quantities of ruddy brown fluid were spurting up in noisy jets out of the machine. So all this ruddy brown fluid, uh, ruddy means red in colour. This ruddy brown stuff spurting out of the machine. My attention was diverted from this death flurry by a furious yelling like that of the thing called a siren in our manufacturing towns. A man knee deep near the towing path shouted in order inaudibly to me and pointed. Looking back, I saw the other Martians advancing with gigantic strides down the riverbank from the direction of Chertsey. The Shepperton guns spoke this time unavailingly. So they, they missed, they didn't manage to hit any more Martians. At that, I, dunk, I ducked at once under the water and holding my breath until movement was an agony, blundered painfully ahead under the surface as long as I could. The water was in a tumult above me. It was all rough and, you know, going like that. And rapidly growing hotter. 
when for a moment I raised my head to take breath and throw the hair and water from my eyes, the steam was rising in a whirling white fog that at first hid the Martians altogether. So we couldn't really see anything because of all the steam. The noise was deafening. Then I saw them dimly, colossal figures of grey, magnified by the mist. They had passed me by, and two were stooping over the frothing, tumultuous ruins of their comrade. So they were bending down over the fallen tripod. The third and fourth stood beside him in the water, one perhaps 200 yards from me, the other towards Laleham. The generators of the heat rays waved high, and the hissing beams smote down this way and that. So they started attacking everything with their heat, ra heat rays. The air was full of sound, a deafening and confusing conflict of noises, the clangorous din of the Martians. Clang, clang is like a loud noise. A din is also a loud noise. Like clangorous was like maybe the noise of heavy metal hitting itself, hitting upon heavy metal. The clang, clangorous din or noise of the Martians. The crash of falling houses, the thud of trees, fences, sheds flashing into flame, and the crackling and roaring of fire. Dense black smoke was leaping up to mingle with the steam from the river, and as the heat ray went to and fro over Weybridge, its impact was marked by flashes of incandescent white that gave place at once to a smoky dance of lurid flames. The nearer houses still stood intact, awaiting their fate, shadowy, shadowy, faint and pallid in the stream, with the fire behind them going to and fro. For a moment, perhaps, I stood there, breast high in the almost boiling water, dumbfounded at my position, hopeless of escape. Through the reek, I could see the people who had been with me in the river scrambling out of the water through the reeds like little frogs hurrying through grass from the advance of a man, or running to and fro in utter dismay on the towing path. The towing path is a path next to the water that uh, horses walk along in order to tow boats. Then suddenly the white flashes of the heat ray came leaping towards me. The houses caved in as they dissolved at its touch and darted out flames. The trees changed to fire with a roar. The ray flickered up and down the towing path, licking off the people who ran this way and that, and came down to the water's edge not fifty yards from where I stood. It swept across the river to Shepperton, and the water in its track rose in a boiling wheel crested with steam. I turned shoreward, turned to the edge of the water. In another moment, the huge wave, well nigh at the boiling point, is basically saying almost at the boiling point, had rushed upon me. I screamed aloud and scolded, as burned by the water, half blinded, agonised, I staggered through the leaping, hissing water towards the shore. Had my foot stumbled, it would have been the end. I fell helplessly in full sight of the Martians upon the broad, bare, gravelly spit that runs down the, that runs down to mark the angle of the way and the Thames, so a sort of little ridge of, of gravel just off the water. I expected nothing but death. I have a dim memory of the foot of a Martian coming down within a score of yards of my head, so within about 20 yards, driving straight into the loose gravel, whirling it this way and that, and lifting again of a long suspense, and then of the four carrying the debris of their comrade between them, now clear and then presently faint through a veil of smoke, receding interminably, as it seemed to me, across a vast space of river and meadow. So they basically slowly disappeared. And then very slowly I realised that by a miracle I had just escaped. Wow. Okay, let me give the summary, uh, aka what the hell just happened. So basically, the two men, uh, the narrator and the soldier that he'd met, reach a chaotic scene in Weybridge as people crowd the railway station and the ferry in an effort to leave. Suddenly they hear gunfire and a large explosion and four tripods come into view across the river. The narrator hides in the water. Um, one of them makes a beeline towards where the narrator is. Six guns hidden in the woods fire on the nearest tripod. 
One shell strikes the tripod and gruesomely kills the Martian inside. Unguided but still moving, the tripod smashes into a church and falls into the river. The other Martians come to the fallen tripod, shooting their heat rays at the village and destroying the opposition. The heat ray from the fallen tripod heats the water in the river and scolds the narrator before he manages to escape. Right, so that is it in terms of the extracts of the story that I'm going to read to you in this series. Okay, so that's it in terms of reading from the story. I'm just going to give a few final comments and a bit of analysis before the end of this now. Okay, so what's it all about? I mean, obviously, it's a rip-roaring adventure of nasty Martians coming to try and take over the world. And, you know, we've seen that story so many times since, haven't we? But all those other stories of like Martians or aliens, monsters trying to take over the world, I think that a lot of them were inspired by this. This is like the first one. And as with most science fiction, there are subtexts or interpretations of the story, like other themes going on. So here are some of those sort of themes or subtexts, as far as I can see. So one of them is the complacency of humans. So as the dominant species on Earth for hundreds of thousands of years, we have become complacent about our position in the natural hierarchy, just assuming that we are safe in our position at the top of the chain. And this is a mistake. Humans could easily be removed from this dominant position by things we aren't even aware of. In the story, this means intelligent creatures from another planet. But in reality, this could be even something like the coronavirus or just something else that we don't usually think about. Another theme is the idea of how how would human society cope with a crisis like this? And this is a common theme in disaster movies, zombie films, science fiction, etc. It all, all it takes is for something to disrupt our carefully organised society and things can descend into chaos quite easily. And this, is, and this often brings out the worst in people. Normal citizens can become immoral and do bad things when the structure of society collapses and we end up having to fight for our own survival. You end up with kind of lawlessness. Also, there's the treatment of animals. The story makes us think about the way that we treat animals, which are below us in the power hierarchy on Earth. Perhaps we should be more compassionate and kind to animals. In fact, this is one of the only conclusions that the narrator reaches in this story, as he suddenly understands what it means to be ruled over by a superior species. Another idea is this, you know, the bigger they come, the harder they fall. And that microorganisms and viruses might be the most powerful forces on Earth, in fact. I'm not going to give away the rest of the story um, unless I do, I don't know, I don't know if people want me to do more of these. Maybe I could do a part four where I kind of go into some more details. There are some really good, exciting moments, like where our hero is trapped in a house and another cylinder lands right next to the house. And so he ends up being trapped in this house and he, through a little gap in the wall, he manages to observe the Martians in the pit uh, and their technology. And he gets really up close and personal first eye uh, views of um, of the Martians and what they do, so you get you get to know more about them. There are more uh, themes, um, including technology, fear, power, and the familiar versus strange. You can read about more of those things on the CourseHero dot com website. For example, the one of technology, the idea that the, the benefits, possibilities, and potential threats of technology uh, represented in the Martian tripods. These things make technology a pervasive theme meaning it runs all the way through um, in the novel. Following the Industrial Revolution, technology changed society dramatically from travel to work to communication. Virtually no part of life was untouched by new inventions. The benefits provided by these new machines meant people could accomplish tasks faster, easier and often independently. But as ever with modern science fiction stories, there is an element of fear regarding advancements in technology and how we may ultimately be surpassed by technological innovations. And, ladies and gents, this is where we're going to stop. I seriously hope you enjoyed this, really. I seriously hope you enjoyed this story. If you're still listening or watching, then hello. 
and thank you very much for sticking with this. Um, I guess it must have it must mean that you've enjoyed this, right? Uh, I guess it must mean that you've been enjoying it. I'm sure it's been challenging at times, but to be honest, I also feel that this is difficult to follow when I read it. Um, there is a sense that things are just beyond your imagination and that your mind has to do quite a lot of work to understand the fairly complex descriptions being given. This is not quite the same as watching a film where everything is shown. You know, in a lot of films, you just get to see everything uh, explicitly. But in books like this, often you get descriptions, which mean that your imagination has to do some of the work. Um, or maybe it's like watching a really well-directed film where you never quite see exactly or clearly what is happening. And this adds to the drama and excitement. The Steven Spielberg version is a bit like that. Um, you do get to see the tripods and stuff, but he never lingers too long on them. So you're always like desperate to see more and that makes them sort of even more frightening. Anyway, thank you for sticking with this and listening all the way through. Let me know what you think of this. And I, I highly recommend reading the rest of the story. There's a lot more action and a few more close encounters with the Martians and their tripods. And of course, the ending of the story is very clever. I won't spoil it, uh, but the book is better than the film, though, uh, I assure you. In terms of English, I hope you found it interesting to hear some samples of old-fashioned English from the 19th century. I would say it's broadly modern English, but with a more formal style. It's really enjoyable, though. I love the descriptiveness and the general command over the language is a joy to behold. Don't forget, you can get the full text for this episode printed right here on the page for this episode on my website. And also there's the YouTube version as well to enjoy where you can see the text on the screen as you read it and listen. Listen to Luke's English Podcast wherever you get your podcasts, Luke's English Podcast. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. Leave a positive review on iTunes maybe and check out my free app. It's the Luke's English Podcast app. It's free from the App Store on your phone. And also consider signing up to Luke's English Podcast Premium to get specific lessons on vocabulary, pronunciation and grammar. That's teacherluke.co.uk slash premium info. Specific lessons from me to you about vocab, grammar, pronunciation. That's it though. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. All the best to you. And all that remains for me to be said now is, well, other than enjoy our wonderful earth, which is not invaded by Martians. And I'll speak to you soon. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. Bye, 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 bye. That's the end of the audio. That's also the end of the video. Um, well done for watching all the way through. As I've said before, YouTube data or metrics would suggest that most people stop watching this around about 12 minutes in. That seems to be the average um, attention span of the typical YouTube user. So if you're still watching this, then you are not the typical YouTube user and you are, you're the best. Well done. And I hope you enjoy the story and I will speak to you soon. But for now, goodbye. <laughs>